So now I'll start with uh, uh, my series of lectures. So uh, it is entitled Decidability, Logic and Enumeration Systems. So um, with this first uh, lecture, um, I, I aim to introduce you with uh, first order logic uh, and make a link with uh, a certain first order logic and uh, be recognizable sets of integers. So I will make a, uh, this precise in a moment. So. Um, the point uh, is uh, to, to prove the, the theorem of uh, Buchy and Bruyère, and then to uh, show you how we can apply uh, this theorem to obtain many decidability results concerning B uh, automatic sequences. So this is uh, the plan for today, and uh, I'll move on uh, with my next uh, two lectures uh, with other problems, but related to this. I, I will make this precise in the end of my uh, lecture. So, uh, just a very uh, broad, large uh, introduction to, to say uh, the kind of uh, question of interest uh, we are uh, in. So, uh, we, in this talk, we will be interested in sets of numbers. So, I'll start with sets of natural numbers, and then uh, along the way, we'll move to uh, real numbers as well. And so we are, uh, in general, concerned with the question, how do we uh, dispose of such sets? And so this is a role of numeration systems in general. You can represent your, your, your numbers uh, in general by words. And so the very uh, basic consideration is to say, uh, how do you get properties of numbers starting from lexicographic or, or combinatorial uh, properties of uh, the representations. So, yes, I have to, okay. So uh, I just listed a, a number of sets of integers, so very uh, easy ones. So squares, prime numbers, even numbers, powers of two, then you can do, uh, a little more complicated uh, relation with numbers, with uh, equations. So, uh, and so I put x5 and x6. In fact, if you look into x5, it's, it's um, an easy set since it's, in fact, ultimately periodic. You just have to, to see it um, by writing down the, the conditions. And so uh, we can ask, what does it mean to be a simple set of, uh, of numbers? It, it depends on the way you represent your numbers. Uh, and so the numeration systems you you in. So this is a link with combinatorics on words. So we we are on the one side numbers, but the representations are words. So uh, usually we represent integers by finite words and real numbers by infinite words. But this is not true anymore. As soon as you consider non-standard numeration systems, you might have uh, integers also represented by infinite words, for example. On the other hand, you have infinite words. May represents uh, sets of numbers, for example, the characteristic sequence of, uh, of a set of integers uh, is an infinite binary word. And so you, we will use uh, back and forth these notions uh, between combinatorics on words and uh, numbers. So of course, uh, this notion can be extended to multidimensional frameworks, which we will do in a minute uh, with uh, the theorem of uh, bouchy bruyere So, Again, still very generally, uh, what I will think of are uh, simple sets uh, will be recognizable sets of integers. And recognizability here depends on the enumeration systems you're in. So if you have a enumeration system, whatever you like, uh, we say that the subset of X of integers uh, is recognizable with respect to that enumeration systems if the language of this representation so which form um, a language over an alphabet, usually called the, the enumeration alphabet, is regular. And here regular means uh, accepted by finite automaton. And so in the multidimensional setting, well, you do the same, except that you have to uh, be careful about the representations. So uh, a subset of uh, n power of d is recognizable with respect to the enumeration systems if 
the sets of uh, the d tuples of their representations, forms a language which is also recognized by a finite automaton. But to form a language, we, you have to be careful to, to pad your symbols with some, your, your representation with some extra symbols in order to have words of the same length. I think uh, Jason uh, mentioned that, and in theory, we, we, we don't really care. It's a, it's a technical thing you, you have to, to care about, but um, it doesn't really change the, the flavor of the results. But still, in my case, I want to build automaton, uh, recognizing sets of integers, so I have to, to make this precise. So uh, the point is that uh, to, to get a language of, uh, multi uh, of representations in a multidimensional framework, you cannot just take the, the, the um, product of the free monoids. Uh, so e for each alphabet, uh, you have a free monoid, so if A is an alphabet, finite alphabet, A star is a free monoid, but when you take the product of uh, free monoids, you, you don't necessarily have a, a free monoid. So uh, clearly, uh, if you, or, uh, already for D equal to 2, uh, you, you see that you can represent uh, elements of the monoid in, in two different ways. So uh, what we do is that we, we take the product of the alphabet and we consider now that the letters are elements of this product. And when you concatenate those uh, products of letters, then you get a language over a sub-monoid of your, your monoid, which now is free because it's uh, uh, of the form A star, where A, uh, the alphabet is a product of alphabets. So uh, we can translate this uh, into integers, and exactly the same considerations uh, go on. So uh, n, the set of integers, is a free monoid, but when you go to the power of d, it's not free anymore. So the question is how you represent subsets of n uh, d, and so it's exactly the same uh, consideration. You don't have a language if you just take the d tuples of representations. So you pad the um, the representation in order to have uh, elements of the same length, and so. Uh, really have a language and an automaton uh, uh, reading uh, tuples of letters. So just a small example, if it's not familiar for you, I don't know, but uh, uh, if you have here uh, three words, you consider the d-tuples of um, those words and you pad with some symbol, uh, here sharp, whatever, uh, you take a symbol which is not in the, the alphabet, and so you make uh, in uh, this way by padding on the left uh, three words of the same length. And so you can really concatenate those letters and you, you, we, we usually uh, synthesize the, this uh, uh, concatenation of letters in just one tuple, but it really means that you have uh, those four letters uh, that you read uh, it re uh, successively. So, of course, here is just a language consideration. Depending on the numeration systems you're in, you will interpret this triplet in a different way. So, for example, in binary case, then you have uh, 5, 9, 1. And uh, if you take another system, maybe the, you know the Fibonacci system, then this triplet will represent another uh, triplet of integers, which is 4, 6, 1. You believe me, but I will define this in a minute. So, uh, just to, to, to end this uh, broad introduction, I want to go through a, a certain number of numeration systems we will encounter in, uh, in my lectures. So, of course, integer-based uh, representation. So, uh, you take an integer b greater than or equal to 2, uh, and uh, you represent any natural number uh, in a greedy way. So, you decompose your integer with respect to the powers of the base, and so you get digits in... Um, uh, is it working? Oh. No, it's the other way around? Or? No. Sorry, but uh, it's not correct. Sorry, you've seen everything already. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to use the pointer, but it's uh, you. Oh, okay, sorry. So uh, the, your digits belongs to the alphabet zero to b minus one. Okay, so uh, you use the greedy algorithm here to, to decompose your integers, and so the only condition it imposes uh, is that uh, the, the greatest, those are the leading digit is non zero. It's your only condition. It means that you, when you take the, <coughs> the language of all possible representation, you have uh, just this constraint. So you start with a digit which is not zero, then you put anything, and 
usually we have the convention that zero is represented by the empty word. So you have a, a regular language for, for your enumeration language. And so remember I said simple sets of number will be uh, recognizable sets with respect to your enumeration system. So here we just say we use B uh, representations of integers and we have defined what's uh, B recognizable sets of N to the D, uh, so in the multidimensional framework. So there are alternative definitions of B recognizable sets. Uh, there are many of them actually, and so uh, I think maybe a good start if you don't know about this is the uh, survey by Bruyère, Ansel, Michaud and Villemer, and so uh, they give uh, some characterizations, so in terms of logic, of uniform morphisms, finiteness of the B kernel, if you remember Jason's talk, uh, algebraic formal series, uh, this is restricted when uh, the base is a prime number, actually, and also uh, particular cases of recognizable or rational formal uh, series, uh, which I will come back uh, in my next uh, Lecture. So this, in this lecture, I just intend to to uh, make the link with logic. So really, uh, the the theorem of Bouchy-Briere links B recognizable sets with sets definable in a certain logic. So. Uh, before going to this, I want just to to. Uh, um, see uh, other kind of uh, ways of representing integers. So you could have just unary representations. So maybe the simplest thing you can think of, you have an integer and you have some symbol, a letter A, and you just concatenate A, A, N times, so you have a representation of a number. So the set, you have no constraints of the representation, so everything A star uh, uh, is the set of all representations. And so here we call uh, recognizable sets in this uh, framework one recognizable sets of integers. So in dimension one, because you have just uh, uh, regular subsets of A star, you just have finite unions of arithmetic progressions. If you know a little bit of languages, it's uh, really straightforward. But in the multidimensional setting, well, if you think about it, it's already a little more complicated to capture uh, the essence of those sets what will be uh, one recognizable set of ND. It's not clear to characterize this uh, in terms of, uh, of numbers. Yeah, I mean, we have a, a characteriz characterization in terms of languages, but in the uh, world of numbers, what can you say? <laughs> so Fibonacci representation, maybe you, you know, we, we've just seen this with the triplet. I was uh, really quick about this, but it's just, uh, you take a Fibonacci sequence, probably you all know it, so uh, you have one, two, and then you add uh, two numbers to get the, the next one. And so this is an increasing sequence of numbers, so you also can use the greedy algorithm to decompose any integer in um, this system. So uh, here the greedy algorithms imports more than having a non-leading uh, zero, uh, a non-zero leading digit. It also says that the valued representation won't contain the two consecutive digits one. So we see that we have uh, more constraints of, uh, the, on the representations. And actually, it's a result by second of that all such words will also be a greedy representation of a natural number. So the set of all possible representation is uh, given by uh, this constraint only. So you start with a one, and then you don't see uh, two consecutive ones in, uh, in your system. So this is a regular uh, language, and you can also define uh, recognizable sets of integer in this context. So positional enumeration systems, I don't want to go deep into this, but it's really just, uh, if you know Fibonacci enumeration system, then you can, the, the, the same kind of considerations uh, can be applied with <clears throat> any increasing sequence of uh, numbers, well, well chosen, it means that you want uh, to deal with a finite alphabet, so you have a constraint of the quotient of two consecutive numbers in your sequence, and also you want to represent all integers, so you have the constraint that the first element is one. And if you have that, then you have a finite alphabet, and you can also apply the greedy algorithms to represent any uh, integers, and we can uh, perfectly talk about you recognizable sets of integers, which will be, um, uh, broader notions that be recognizable sets of integers, since uh, any uh, uh, B numeration systems, integer based numeration systems, is uh, in particular a positional uh, numeration system. 
So here, uh, to conclude this introduction, it's just that if you are in this framework of U uh, systems, well, you, you want to char characterize the set of all possible representations, but already you don't know. It's really dependent on the base you've chosen. So a description of this numeration language highly depends on the context, the, the sequence you've taken. So uh, probably the, the algebraic, if, if the sequence is linear, depend, uh, is uh, important, uh, or other properties of the sequence can help you to, to understand what's the set of all representations. And of course, you could also think of other ways uh, as the, not just the greedy algorithms to represent teachers, you could um, use lazy algorithm or even choose uh, all possible representation of a given integer or, or other, I mean, I just listed a few and you, you, you can start with that and, and think of something else and, and you have the same kind of definitions of recognizable sets within a, a enumeration system. So, I hope that helps you to see what we are interested in, in, in very general uh, ways, so numbers and their representations and different ways of representing numbers. And so now I want to start uh, by um, the consideration with first order theory in base B, so I'm now restricting myself for this uh, lecture uh, in, for uh, integer base uh, numeration systems and make the link with automata. So we will going into uh, bouchy bruyere theorem. So I just recall B recognizable sets of integers. It's really you take the integer uh, base B representation of uh, integers, and then you 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 are in the multidimensional framework in general. So you pad with some extra symbol to get uh, um, a language, a sublanguage of the numeration language, uh, and you say that the set of integers is be recognizable if this uh, set of representations is regular. So for d equals to one, uh, if you know about b automatic sequences, this is equivalent to say that it's the characteristic sequence of the set is b automatic, right? So. It's a little exercise, you can see that it's really equivalent, you can bo go both ways. And so, what does it mean to be B-automatic? I recall it means that there exists a DFAO, it means a deterministic finite automaton with output, that on input, the representation of certain n, uh, it outputs one if the integer n is in the set and outputs zero otherwise. So just an example, you take any automaton, you consider uh, b equals to 2, you, so you can read zeros and 1. Uh, you have a deterministic finite automaton, and you have outputs. So on the first state, you output 0, on the third, uh, second state, you output 1, and so you generate some sequence, which is 2 automatic. So here, um, this sequence, uh, I don't know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and Two, three, four, yeah, five. <laughs> Say five, five uh, in base two is one, zero, one. So you go one, zero, one, and so you output the zero. And you do that for every n. So uh, this sequence is a binary sequence. So it corresponds to a set of integers. So you put the integer if uh, there is a one in position n. So one, zero is not, one, two uh, are in the set, three is not in the set, four is in the set, and so on. So you, you can talk about this set as a two uh, recognizable set uh, of integer. So maybe the most popular um, theorem concerning B uh, automatic sequences and more, or maybe um, B recognizable sets, is not Bucky Briere uh, theorem, but um, uh, Cobham or Cobham Semenov uh, theorem if you think of multidimensional framework. So I want to state this uh, very important theorem here. So uh, what uh, they, they say, so Cobham did it in a one-dimensional case and then Semenov extended it to multi-dimensional case. So just take B and B prime, B multiplicatively independent bases. So I think Jason uh, defined that. Uh, it's not in my slide, so it means that no powers of the first base is a power of the second base. So you have the, that property on the basis and if a subset uh, of integer, a multi-dimensional subset of integer is simultaneously B recognizable and B prime recognizable, then uh, they show that the set is what's called semilinear. So if you don't know semilinear sets, I just put the, the definition there. It's 
uh, finite unions of linear sets. And a linear set is a set of the, this form. So you have a certain, uh, um, like a certain number of periods, and then you can translate by uh, some vector in addition. And so you have really unions of sets of this form. So it's really restrictive in, in, uh, in general. If you want to be uh, recognizable in two independent bases, then you have to be semi-linear. So it's just the same theorem. I just wanted to make this remark that, of course, uh, as a corollary, we get that as linear sets, and so finite unions of, semi -linear, eh, of linear sets are always B recognizable for any B, then we have a characterization. We have that a subset uh, is recognizable uh, for all base, bases B, uh, if and only if it is semi-linear. And so here we have B greater than or equal to two. If you remember, we define what's, what were uh, one recognizable set of integers. And so uh, just uh, as a remark, we can't replace here b uh, greater than or equal to two by b greater than or equal to one. Why? Well, it's just because of the other way of common theorem. <laughs> Linear sets are not uh, in general one recognizable. So I said it's already uh, more complicated to capture the essence of uh, one recognizable set in multidimensional settings. Well, uh, in particular, you have that linear sets are not always one recognizable. So just as a small example, if you take this uh, set, of course, it's a linear set, and it's not one recognizable, because when you, you represent this in uh, uh, the numeration systems of uh, unary uh, representation of integers, well, what you get is this clear for you. So you have uh, a to the n, a to the two n, but we have to pad to have elements of the same length. So this means that I can decompose my, my uh, representation in this way. And so if I had a, a finite automaton recognizing this set, I could apply, if you know the pumping lemma, uh, uh, I take n sufficiently large, and then I will get some uh, extra uh, elements of my set. I cannot just stay with uh, the condition n and 2n. So I want to go now to, into bouchy bruyere theorem. So uh, we had Cobham theorem saying that if you are uh, uh, recognizable in multiple bases, then it's really restrictive. And here it's really, yes, but given a base b, what can you say about b recognizable sets? Can you characterize them? Can you feel what it's uh, in, in the side of numbers? It's not just having a, uh, well, it, it is just, it's the definition of having a, a, an automaton uh, computing the set, but you want to know uh, how can you build this set uh, on the number side. And so they say, okay, it's uh, recognizable, B recognizable, if and only if it is B uh, definable. Usually this uh, result is attributed to Bucchi, so I attribute it to both Bucchi and Bruyère because there was a mistake in uh, Bucchi's proof, which was corrected by um, Bruyère, so I think it's, uh, it's fair <laughs> to, to, say, uh, to, to, to mention both of them. So I, I explain what uh, was the mistake of uh, Bucchi, uh, which was corrected by Bruyère. So, of course, uh, in order to make you understand uh, this uh, theorem, I have to, to make precise what are def B definable sets of, uh, of integers. So, I don't know uh, how many of you are, are used with uh, first order logic. <laughs> so, uh, I just want to go uh, into these definitions uh, to, to make it clear what are B definable sets of, uh, of numbers. So, take a logical structure. Here I'm very uh, generic saying that. So uh, you have a domain D and you have some functions and relations in your structure, maybe some constants. And you say a set uh, X uh, belonging to D to the N, so in a multidimensional framework, is definable in this structure if there exists a first order formula, phi. So it depends on N. Uh, variables and free variables because you are in uh, multi-dimension n. Uh, and what does it defining the set? So it means that uh, for all uh, n tuples of elements in the domain, the formula will be true uh, in this n tuples if and only if the n tuples belongs to the set. So it means exactly that the set is those uh, n tuples of elements of the domain for which the formula is true. And so 
first order formula. I don't know uh, if you are uh, familiar with that, but first order formula, just to, to recall or maybe to define for, for those who don't know, are uh, defined recursively. So how do we do that? We, we start from variables. So we are given uh, countably many uh, number of variables, x1, x2, uh, etc. And uh, they are intended to describe elements of the domain D. Uh, we always assume that the equality belongs to the domain, so sometimes it's definable and sometimes it's not, but uh, we, we always assume that uh, it belongs to the relation of uh, the structure. Uh, we have some relation and function given in, in a structure, and then starting from these uh, three uh, points, then we can build really a new uh, formula by using connectives, so logical connectives, or and implication by implication on negation, and quantifiers on variables, so quantifiers, universal quantifiers for all, and exists, which is existential uh, quantifiers on variables. So this is important because this is what makes the formula first order. If you quantify about on sets, then you, you're not in a first order case. So, uh, the Pressburger arithmetic is, so we are interested in sets of integers, and so you just take the addition as a relation on your set of integers. And so what can be defined in a Pressburger arithmetic? So we have just the relation plus, and with plus and the domain n, then we are able to define uh, oh, sorry, um, the, the order on elements. So uh, uh, the element x is less than y, is definable in Pressburger arithmetic by this formula. So it means that there exist some elements in the domain and such that uh, x plus z is y. It's exactly, it means that x is less than or equal to y. And this is true in n plus, but it's not true in z plus. Is it clear why? So of course the fact that we have only positive elements in the domain play uh, crucial roles here yeah, uh, in Pressburger arithmetic. So usually when you see the structure z plus, you always add the, the, the relation less than or equal to because you cannot define it just uh, from the addition. And so here, equality is actually is definable, right? So I said we would add uh, equality to each structure, but actually you don't have to do that because uh, in that case, because it's definable, because uh, two elements are equal if one is less than the other and, and the other way around is true too, which is not true, uh, again, in, in uh, Z plus. So X equals zero. This is definable by this uh, uh, equation. So it's definable in any domain where this equation has a unique solution, uh, X equals zero. So X plus X equals X. So it's okay in that plus, it's also okay in Q and, and every domain where you have a, a unique solution to that equation, which is zero. Uh, now if you want to define other constants, other uh, integers, x equal to one, well, it's okay, it's definable in n plus because it means that for all elements in the domain, either it is zero or it is greater than uh, x. So it means that it's the smallest element in the domain, which is not uh, zero in n, this element is one, but it's not true. You cannot do that in z plus because there is no smallest element in the domain. So this is really particular to, to n. And so inductively, you have one, then you can uh, define any constant in actually in Pressburger arithmetic. And it means also that the, if you take a progress, arithmetic progression, well, it's definable in the structure. The arithmetic progression is the set of uh, those uh, integer x, such that for all, uh, such that, sorry, there is some y, uh, such that x is a y plus b. So you could wonder, a y is not really uh, an addition. Well, yes, it is an addition because you've fixed uh, a uh, uh, is fixed, and so uh, a y stands for y plus y plus y a times. So any uh, fixed arithmetic progressions is definable, and in fact, 
uh, it's a well-known result that uh, those uh, finite unions of arithmetic progression are exactly what you can define in plus regard arithmetic. So this is for you, the unidimensional case. And in the case of the multidimensional framework, what you can define is exactly sublinear sets. So remember of Cobham theorem, if you are recognizable in two independent bases, then in fact you are definable in Fosberger arithmetic. And if you remember of Bruchy theorem, Bruyère theorem, then you have a reformulation of Cobham theorem in terms of logic. So if two uh, sets of uh, numbers are definable in two uh, in mul uh, multiplicatively independent bases, then it's definable in Pressburger arithmetic. Okay, so um, now I'm ready to define what are B definable sets. So a set is B definable is if it is definable in the structure and plus, so Pressburger arithmetic, and an additional uh, function VB, which is base B dependent. So plus is just the addition, and VB of X is a unary function that maps an integer to the largest power of B of the base dividing X. It's a definition, and this is how we, we define B definable sets. And there is an exception when uh, you, uh, your integer is zero, then you, you put a one. So VB of zero is one. So for example, the set of the powers of the base uh, is definable, uh, is B definable, I should be definable uh, in the structure N plus VB. Uh, just saying that a, uh, a number is a power of B if and only if um, uh, VB of X is X. Is this clear? Okay. So, however, it can be shown that, okay, you could say, consider the structure N plus PB. And PB is another um, function that maps an integer to one or zero. Uh, in the first case, you say it's true, it's one, if X is the power of B. So you can test if an integer is a power of B or it's not power of B. But we can show that these structures are not equivalent. So. Everything here can be defined in n plus vb, but the other way around is not true. And actually, that was the part uh, where Buki was wrong. So um, we are correcting that uh, that part uh, in the theorem. Okay, so I'll go uh, into uh, more deeply into this uh, result. So I mention it again. <laughs> so. Uh, Take uh, an integer base B, a set, a uh, multidimensional set of integers is B recognizable if and only if it is B definable. And what's important for us and for the application will be uh, the point of the talk is that both directions are effective. What do I mean by effective? It means that if it's B recognizable, it means that I have in, at my disposal an automaton recognizing the representation of the integers in the set, and then I am able to effectively construct a formula of the, uh, of the structure which defines X. Right? Conversely, if I have the formula which defines some set, I am able to effectively construct an automaton accepting the language of the representation of the, the set. So if I, I don't know. Well, I want to do the part of the proof of the board, so it's not in my slides. Uh, so I want to make this precise in one direction. I'm interested in the direction that will give me decidability results. So it means that I'm interested in the, uh, the, the, the size, the, um, sorry, the, the, the direction <laughs> where I start from a first order formula and I am able to build uh, an automaton. So maybe I can put this. This here? No? Well, I want, don't want you to be disturbed by the slides. <laughs> when I, oh, when I disapprove, and then. I think it's nice to see this proof because it's not very hard, but it's really, you, you, you really see what's happening. And, uh, and it's really nice to have this characterization in terms of uh, definable sets. I think it's really intuitive what, we, what you can do and what you cannot do. So uh, I want to start with a, a phi, which is a first order formula. Um, should write maybe. <laughs> of my structure, which is n plus 
VB. And so I want to build, so I have a corresponding sets, set of uh, integers, which I denote x phi, uh, which is uh, defined by phi. So it's the set of uh, n1, 2, and d, such that phi of n1 and d is true. Right? And so, uh, to build an automaton accepting exactly this set, I'm going to use the uh, recursive definition of first order formula. It means that I want to uh, say that for the atomic formula of the structure, I can do it, and then by induction, uh, I'll be able to, to um, uh, recognize every set uh, when I apply the, the connectors uh, and uh, the, um, the quantifiers uh, on those atomic formulas. So what I will do is that I want to build a DFA accepting uh, all the representation of numbers uh, in this set. So it means that I write it and explain it in a, in a moment, but I want to accept um, and I pad with a zero. So there are two uh, maybe technical <laughs> remarks that here I said before I, I padded with uh, an extra symbol, here I will pad with zeros, which you can show uh, that it's, equi it's equivalent, so it's easier for me to build the formula with zeros than, uh, I mean, if you pad with an extra symbol, so you will really have a, a huge number of states uh, instead. Uh, and uh, saying that you want to recognize this language is also simpler for, um, the constructions, so I explain why uh, we do that, and this set is uh, regular, if and only if this one is regular, so it's uh, uh, exactly the same results if I say that I accept all representation or just the, the canonical representation. So uh, I do an induction. <laughs> on uh, the formula phi. So the structure is n plus vb. So remember, in Pressburger arithmetic, equality is already defined. So we just have to show that uh, uh, n itself is recognized by some automata, but in base b we have no restriction. Uh, the, the greedy algorithms just ask to start with a non-zero leading digits, but as you, you allow uh, padding with um, extra zeros in front, then you have absolutely no constraints. So uh, I'll just build the automaton for base B equal to two, and you can adapt the constructions for, for bigger bases. So, uh, this DFA accepts all uh, representation in, in the domain. Then you have addition, addition, maybe I can do this here, but addition uh, in an integer base is realizable by uh, an automaton. Uh, it's not very hard to see, maybe you know it, maybe you don't know it, so I can do that really quickly. So I, I'll go with base two. So I start and what I did not say, it does not have any implication with n, but that I will do also the reversed representation. So this just means that I'm going to, to read my uh, representation from right to left. It's easier for addition. So uh, if I add uh, numbers in base b, I start with zero, zero. It's just really a calculus, just uh, 
you go in columns that you want, what you want to accept is those triplets x, y is dead, such that x plus y is equal to z. And you go digits by digits from right to left. So you have two zeros and nothing happens. So what, there's two states you can be in. Either you have a carry in your, in your uh, current addition or you don't have a carry. And of course you accept if you don't have any carry anymore. So here I have no carry. If I have, what can I read for my X and Y? Uh, I have four choices. Either I put zero, zero. If I want to respect the addition, I have to put a zero for, for the Z. Here I have zero, one. If I want to respect the addition, I have to put a one uh, for the Z. And I stay in my state with no carry. It's exactly the same if I put zero, one or one, zero. I respect the addition by putting a one and staying in that state. But now if I have a one, one, this is a case where I go to a carry state. So I have one and one. Well, I put a zero, but I have a carry. So I have to change my state to do that. So I go to my carry state and then well, whatever I read except zero, zero, I stayed with a carry, right? Here I have one zero, uh, I have my zero and I, stay, I, I keep my carry. Of course, it's the same if I have zero, one. If I put one, one, what happens? Well, I still have a carry. I have a one and a carry. So the only way to get out of this state is to read zero, zero, and then I put a one. And so I accept if I have no carry. So it's a really addition in base two. And of course, you can generalize this consideration really easily for any uh, integer base B. Um, and so you see that you really have uh, zeros in front that you can accept. So you have just not the, the canonical representation here with this automaton, uh, but you have all, uh, all representations uh, of those uh, triplets of integers respecting addition. And so for VB, the third um, uh, element in my structure, well, remember VB of an integer is the largest power of this integer uh, dividing uh, it. So if I have the representation of X, well, what does it mean? That I have some zeros if I go from right to left, and sometimes I have the first non-zero digits. I have a one. So this is true if the integer is not zero. And then I have things, whatever. And so VB of X, I should, right. Well, if you go to, to representation, so I put V2 here, uh, it's exactly uh, this representation. Is it clear? Right, so it's really the largest powers of B dividing X. So it means that I can do this really uh, easily with a, so I should maybe, yeah. right, is it there? With an automaton. So uh, if I go from right to left, if I read zeros, nothing happens, but I, as soon as I read a one, I also want a one for VB of X. And now whatever I read for X, I put a zero for VB of X. Okay, and then I accept here. So it's not quite perfectly okay <laughs> because I did not manage the, the case where VB zero is one, right? So I have to be careful when, if I read only zeros, I want to output one. Right, so it means that I want to accept uh, these pairs. So it means that, um, uh, yeah, I want to accept the pair zero one, and here um, so I add an extra state, which does exactly the same as my uh, previous initial state, but I accept. Zero one. So it's just the way that you want to uh, accept some particular um, pairs, which was not in your language. So this automaton really 
uh, accept all uh, the base B representation of the pairs of the form X, V, B of X. So that's okay for um, the formula from the structure. Now we go really into the induction. So, um, for the induction itself, what can we do? We said that we can use logical connectors and so on, and you can use quantifiers on variables. So we don't have to do that for every uh, connector, since uh, some can be obtained from the others with using uh, negation, suitable negation. So I'll just do this with the OR, logical OR, and the AND. Are you all convinced? It's really uh, easy logic that if I have phi AND psi, this is logically equivalent to negation of negation of phi OR negation of psi. So if I have negation and or, it's okay for and. So I'll just do those two, and implication, well, it's an exercise, you can show that phi implies phi, psi uh, is also uh, defined with the or and with the negation. And though the same here applies for quantifiers. If I do it for existential quantifiers with suitable negation, I'll be able to, to refine uh, the the universal quantifier. If I do for all x phi of x, this is logically equivalent to the negation of there exists x, negation of phi of x. Right? So I'll just do the three for my induction. So maybe we start with the negation. So, uh, this means I have uh, some current formula phi, and I want to uh, build an automaton for the, the formula, the negation of phi. So I have uh, an automaton m phi uh, for five. So, accepting uh, all uh, well, I'll be um, a little vague, but I, I'll say everything. So, um, I have a, an automaton accepting all the representations of the integer for which uh, phi uh, is true. And so, we modify this DFA M phi to uh, accept all I mean, all the representation of the integers satisfying the negation of five. So it means that just by reversing final and non-final status of each state, well, it does a job. And this is true because we, um, we said we would uh, recognize every representation of integers. So we had to take that care because if you don't say that at first, then you have um, maybe uh, if you just reverse final uh, and non-final status of each state, it means that you could perfectly accept uh, non-canonical representations of integers uh, um, for which uh, phi of, this integers is, uh, of these integers is true, right? So we have a problem uh, which we handled by uh, the, the work condition. So we might uh, by interchanging the final and non-final status of each state. And so, uh, this new DFA um, um, uh, where I would just say works for negation of five, right? So you can write the details. Um, for the 
for the part for the or. So if I have phi or psi, it means that I have some formula phi, and I will detail which are the free variables of phi. So I write it this way. So these are the free variables within phi, these are the free variables within psi, and you see that they can share some of them. So it means that the free variables in uh, phi or psi are all the k plus l plus m free variables appearing in, uh, in both of them. So if now you have a DFA m phi for phi, it means that uh, this DFA, it reads uh, K plus L tuples of letters. Um, letters of this form. So what we do is we say, okay, let's modify this automaton by adding extra transitions. So by replacing every transition. So I just write some Q, I read some letter A12, AK, B12, BL, and you go into some state Q prime, and you replace every such transition by two to the M, which is the number of free variables in Psi that don't appear in Phi, two to the M transitions from the same state Q to the same state Q prime. Okay, so you have two to the m choice because we're in base two. It's k to the m choice if we're in base k. And so this means that this new automaton, so modified, modified m phi, it recognizes x phi times n to the m. We have no constraint on the, the last uh, m uh, variables. And so what we do is exactly the same thing for m psi. So we uh, build from m psi a new DFA recognizes, recognizing, sorry, um, not tall, but uh, not so small, <laughs> um, recognizing. And this time, we will replace the first uh, components uh, to add those k variables. So we will recognize n to the k times x psi. Right? And now you do the unions of those two automaton. By unions, I mean that really I do a product of automaton. So um, by doing the product of automaton, automata. So for each transition Q1, Q2, where you read uh, 
such a K plus L plus M tuple. If you are familiar with that, it's really easy, but you just go to a state Q1 prime with respect to the first uh, transition in the first automaton and in a state two Q2 prime with respect to what does the second automaton. And so you ask now that uh, the set of finite state of the new automaton is the set of finite state uh, for the first automaton. So uh, do that correctly. Uh, it's F phi and everything in the automaton for psi. And then uh, you also, uh, uh, you just take the union, sorry. Um, and here is a, sorry. Uh, you take every uh, accepting here for phi and you cross with the accepting state for psi. So it means that if you, accept, if you, you start with the initial state in both automata, reading this, uh, uh, tuples of letters, then you uh, are accepting in the uh, cross the product automata if either you are the, the k plus l first components are uh, accepted in the automata for phi and or if uh, the last uh, l plus m components are accepted in the automata for psi. So we, you really accept uh, the the set of integers which are true for either phi or psi. And finally, we have to do the, the existential quantifier. Uh, use all the backboard. Maybe I can do it here. So the last part of the blue is to uh, uh, say if you have a formula phi of x I write it this way, so I write the free variables of phi, and I want to quantify over some uh, variable x within phi. So it means that I have an automaton m phi for my formula phi. It reads m plus one tuples of integers, and so uh, we modify this DFA by projecting on the M last components of, uh, of your alphabet. So it means that you replace every transition Q by a transition. So you just erase the first component of your, your tuple. So this means that if this was accepted in the first, well, this will be accepted. So you, you, you keep the status of finite and finite states in, in the new uh, automaton, but this also means that if it is accepted after, then it was accepted before for some A, which is exactly uh, the existential quantifier line here. So here we have to be careful, because in this construction, uh, something wrong can happen. Actually, two things can happen wrong. The first one is uh, that uh, you start from a DFA, but what you get is not anymore a DFA. It's an NFA. What you get is a non-deterministic finite automaton. So it's not really a problem in theory because it means that just you, you have an automaton accepting some, recognizing some set of integers, you can determinize it and, and, and you still have the property, but in practice it means that determinizing a fi uh, deterministic a finite automaton, uh, non-deterministic finite automaton means that you can have an explosion of the number of states. So, uh, well, uh, this is something we have to deal with. And the second thing is, well, we said that we want to accept, I think it's there, all representations of integers. 
and something might go wrong here. Suppose that A is different from zero, but all those are zero, right? So then you, now you project to, to something which is all zeros here. So this means that you might uh, accept uh, some uh, uh, canonical representation here of this m tuples, and now you, you are able to accept some non canonical representation of this m tuples, and vice versa. Right? So you, you might have a problem with saying that you will accept all uh, representation of your integers which again, in theory, is not really a problem because now you can again modify the system method in order to recover every representation of your m tuples of integers, then you determinize it, but this means adding uh, potentially many extra states. Okay, so, uh, so that's it for the proof because we, deal, we dealt with the, the atomic formulas and the three uh, ways of constructing formulas from um, from the definition of uh, uh, first order formulas, right? So, probably, yeah. So, I, I'll stop with this uh, proof now, and so uh, it's tomorrow. I uh, will explain how we can apply this theorem to obtain decidability results um, for uh, automatic sequences. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. The, the statement, the set of power of three is not the, the, the finishable in uh, the arithmetic with the sum and the function v2. Yes. Could this statement be written in the, the same arithmetic if we put uh, the multiplication? Because uh, in the arithmetic with the plus, you cannot uh, define the statement. So the definability could be defined in piano arithmetic. So I repeat the question. Uh, uh, yeah, everybody heard the question. <laughs> if I have to repeat the question. So um, we cannot define V3 in, uh, in N plus V2. This is a Cobham uh, theorem saying that. Uh, and you ask where, uh, whether we can define V3 if you add multiplication? No, no, the, that, that the, 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 the statement, the set of power of 3 is not definable in a N plus V2. V2. Yeah. This statement cannot be written in N plus V2 because it's not definable. You cannot uh, write something that you cannot define. So, my question is, could you use piano arithmetic in order to make a statement about the arithmetic just about the sum without the product? I'm not sure I'm completely answered, uh, understood the question. So, can I use a piano arithmetic with multiplication to define? <laughs> Sorry. That is to say, could you make a model about uh, this arithmetic in piano arithmetic? And in piano arithmetic, could you define the statement that something cannot be defined inside that arithmetic? <laughs> um, I don't know what to say uh, to. To answer the question, I'm sorry, I, I, I understand the question, you, you, you but are uh, I have theory. no answer. Uh, in, I can. In, you, you are working in set theory. In set theory, you can define the definability, the definability in that arithmetic. In set theory, that is or, or that that is okay. But my question is, in piano arithmetic is powerful enough in order to do that, or you need to take all the set theory in order to do that. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I understood the question, but uh, I don't know if it's powerful enough to say that some power of three is not definable in... I, don't know. I look at Michel because maybe he has an answer, but I, I don't know. I don't know. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a bad answer. But <laughs> so I have another question with respect to what you said at the end. If you mm -hmm. start by a formula phi, can you always construct a DFA of polynomial size in phi? Because you said there is an explosion of... Yes, I, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so I, I was to, I want, so I intend to make this clear um, uh, in, in the rest of my lectures, but uh, no, you, you, uh, each time you have a quantifier, which is existential or, or universal, then you, 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 what you actually construct is a non-deterministic finite automaton, which means that if you want to, to go back with a DFA. Potentially, yes. Potentially. But maybe there's a better proof. That's, that remains in polynomial size. I really don't see how you can avoid this uh, non-deterministic case in examples. I think you can always find uh, formulas where you won't be able to... I mean, I think you really can construct a formula for which you will... Uh, maybe a, an exotic formula, but a formula for which you can really have this uh, explosion happening. So you will have a formula of size n, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the smallest deterministic finite automaton uh, recognizing the corresponding set of integers will be of huge size. So I don't think there is a better proof in general. But what's better in general is that this is worst case uh, scenario. So it means that in practice, most of the time, we, we don't see that explosion happening. But I mean, in theory, and I think you really can construct a, uh, an example that will give you the... I mean, just as in the, the case of uh, the, the explosion... Uh, just your mm, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another question is, if you choose a, a set U of base representatives, as you said before, an increasing sequence mm -hmm. of numbers where the quotients are bounded, and you replace VB by taking the largest element of U, which is smaller than the, yeah. than the term. Then what can be said? Is there still a theorem? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I won't prove this, but I will mention it. But uh, yes, there is a theorem by uh, uh, Véronique Bruyère and uh, Georges Ancel, who proves that U recognizable correspond exactly to U definable sets where uh, the function VU, so replacing that VB, uh, is defined, I think, just as you said. So the, the, the uh, first non-zero digits uh, in the, on the, from the right in the, the expansion of N. So, it says yes. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank you. Thank you as well. We have a coffee break. <laughs>